Today we're going to discuss understanding mental illnesses. In your manuals, it, it, it says something totally different. It was like um, introduction to developmental disabilities, but it was an intro. Um, I thought that this one is a little bit more relevant. It's along the same lines, but it's more comprehensive. So understanding mental illness, understanding depression, mania, schizophrenia, um, all of those different variables right there. Um, I think that this training is really good. It's really important, uh, particularly for our young folks, because um, as you guys are aware that um, for a mental illness diagnosis, the onset is normally in the late teens, early 20s, um, is when you start seeing some changes in their mental uh, behavior. So we're going to talk about um, the mentally ill and just why they are like hated, they're hated, they're discriminated against. And um, they're, they're treated differently. Why do you guys think that people with mental illness are, is, are treated differently? Because people think they're crazy. Absolutely. And also, they don't understand it. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, popular media often says that people with mental illnesses are serial killers and they're the scum of the earth. Right. Yeah, the perception is really like negative, violent stereotypes, you know, very, very stereotypical as well. Um, unfortunately, a lot of things in the media um, as it relates to violence. Um, recently have been um, folks with mental illnesses. Um, um, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Even there was some... Yeah, I was, yeah, boy, I was, yes, what, three, two days ago? Or in Atlanta. Yeah. Yeah, I was Thank just looking God, at this. Kill anybody. Right, but just having somebody who who wasn't uh, afraid of him or didn't show any fear and was able to like talk him um, down or de-escalate him to the point where he was able to surrender, you know, that, that was key. So, you know, to me, when I heard that, I said, you know, this individual who is a bookkeeper, right? She's a bookkeeper at this school, right? Yeah, the librarian. It's like, wow, you know, she had to have some sort of skill, some sort of training, something that, that, that gave her the ability to talk him down because she seemed like an expert. Like, she was better than some 911 experts that I heard, it's like people who were, like, trained in it as well. So, um, so we're going to talk about all of the variables connected to a mental illness. So what is a mental illness, essentially? Um, it's just when an individual lacks the ability to manage uh, the day-to-day -day responsibilities that, that we all have. So if we think back, rewind back two to three hours when we first woke up this morning, you think about what you did. You got out the bed, you know, you may have brushed your teeth, took a shower, you know, ironed your clothes, made something to eat, said Miss Linda, uh, got your car, drove, <laughs> and drove here, you know, all, all on your own. Um, but someone with a mental illness, you know, doing something uh, so basic, that would be um, very detrimental to their, their day's outcomes. I mean, they, they would not have the ability to get up, get dressed, and do something so routine that they essentially forget about what their responsibilities are. So they can't manage just day-to-day -day events, okay? Um, so they can't control their, their physical and, and emotional um, behaviors either. So those are the, some of the things that, that are challenging for that population, some things that are very difficult for them. So with mental illnesses, um, it definitely doesn't discriminate against your age, your race, your socioeconomic background, your religion, your income. You know, it can happen to anybody. It can happen to any of us. And I think that, you know, although how society um, stereotypes this population, I mean, all of us are one head injury away from being mentally ill, okay, God forbid, one car accident, if you will. So uh, mental illnesses are not the result of um, personal weaknesses, you know, or lack of character or, or poor upbringing. So we can't say that they had um, bad parents so they became mentally ill. Like some people say these things. I mean, if you look back at the history of mental illness and how um, it was dealt with in the beginning of time, right? When people were getting like shock therapy and, and being isolated, they basically were being experimented on. And the perception was that, you know, if someone had this mental illness, you could just, you know, go and get some sort of treatment and it could be fixed. Like having a cold and, and having a, uh, you know, taking a pill or taking some, um, uh, I don't know, Robitussin or something that it would cure. But we were looking at it from a... Uh, a westernized type, type of uh, way as well. You had your hand up? Yeah, because I'm wondering, well, I don't know, I've read somewhere before, and God knows it was way before I even thought about working in this, but um, 
it has something to do with the developmental of the frontal lobe or something right. like that. Like everybody who doesn't develop at the same time or the same way. Absolutely. And um, I forgot the guy named that finally kind of um, discovered that that probably was the, some of the cause of people being schizophrenic or whatever. You know, sure. outside of them shocking people to death and all of that yeah. kind of thing. So is, is that? Sort yeah, of absolutely. Yeah, oh, definitely. Okay. I mean, I'm definitely going to touch on that oh, okay. as well, but not only with just mental illnesses, but also like autism mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. um, you know, all of the spectrums of autism, which is Asperger syndrome as well. You know, just that brain development or just brains are developed differently and have different functionalities. I mean, autism, that's a whole nother training within itself that I do have a whole curriculum for autism. But um, the way that those individuals' brains work is, is fascinating. I mean, just that they don't have the ability to... Um, to with their own brains. Or, or even just to do the social uh, component. Yeah. Something as easy as uh, tying the shoe or making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. But they can tell you every fact about World War Two, and, and, and you know that that's 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 just fascinating how they could just store that data. But the the social piece and not being able to have any empathy or sympathy with anyone that's that's a lack. That's something that they're lacking in. So it's it's interesting and fascinating. So when we talk about mental illness, like why should we care? Why should we even have this training? Why should we even talk about individuals who have um, a mental illness? Because we deal with people every day. They say behavioral. I mean, a lot of our kids do have behavioral issues, but I think they have mental illnesses too. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Right. And you know the early, the signs are there. I mean, you know, you, you'll start seeing some of the signs, and we'll we'll go through that as well. But I mean, one of the things why, well, a couple of things why we want to care is because yes, we do work with these individuals, but also you know these individuals live in our community, mm -hmm. so if we don't deal with them, then our, it, it it impacts our community. You know, and I worked at Hopkins. I worked in community psychiatry with adults who had um, access one diagnoses. And before they could even get in the program, we would go out and do outreach once a month to try to get um, them to be a part of our program. And you had a lot of people who were homeless, who were there, who were literally living in the streets, living in a box. And um, you know, I never forget this guy. He was living underneath a, a, the bridge over there, under 83 on Bath Street. And uh, he lived in this big box, and I could not stand having to go there and try to engage this guy because he's told you know he's homeless, he was schizophrenic, and you try to uh, talk to him. And, client? Well, we were trying to get him to get into the program oh. to become a client, and um, he was very resistant, very volatile, very loud. So he was scary, you know. He was scary. <laughs> I said, "Oh my goodness, man, I'm scared of this guy right here." Um, uh, you know, he was very intimidating. And, you know, so we did little things, you know, every day to try to get him engaged and try to basically get him to trust us. So um, giving him coffee, you know, finding out what he liked, bringing him little treats so that he could trust us and getting him shoes and things of that nature. And one day he said, you know, I'm ready to get some help. And then we took him on into um, Hopkins and he was on, we put him um, in the psychiatric um, unit, um, which was Maya 3, and um, he was there for about a week, and then they tested his blood levels. They gave him different medication to get him to baseline, and when he came to my office, it was like the sun was, that was hiding inside this man's body had came out. He was upright, and he, got, he walked up, and he, um, you know, he talked to us, and he told us how great he felt. He was able to articulate his feelings, whereas before, he was like an animal. Like, you, could, you didn't know what it was about. But, so this was like early on in my career in mental health, and I was one of those who was like anti-psychotropic medication. Like, man, they're using these experiments. And, but this guy, you know, his, his story, just seeing him go from living in a box, homeless, on the street, no shoes, um, urinating in the bottles, you know, to being upright and, and being able to articulate himself helped me change my mind. And I was able to help this gentleman 
um, you know, get an apartment and you know, get some clothes and really reintegrate himself back into life. You know, the biggest thing was he had to take his medication. Yeah. And that's the thing. And just like with us, if we feel sick and we take our medication, as soon as we start getting better, what do we do? Stop. We stop yeah, taking the medication, and then what happens? Yeah, the we get like, sick. Oh, same mm-hmm. thing with, with mental illness. So, was he like living in the streets? Was like since a teenager or something? No, he was living out there for it had to be about 10, 15 years. It was oh, double digits yeah. because, just like with folks, many people who have mental illnesses, their families. They don't know how to deal with right. them, and you know, so they kick him out the house, mm-hmm. and you know, the, he was totally estranged from his family. But as he started making some progress and started going to therapy on a regular basis, he had his apartment, he got his entitlements. He said, "I want to go see my mom," and his mom lived right across the street from Hopkins, oh my directly goodness. across the street from Hopkins, oh and we walked right across the street. And he was able to meet his family. They were so happy to see him. It was like this family reunion, but it was like having the old son back. He was that person before all of the onset went on because the medication, it normalizes you. It normalizes, you know, those behaviors, those voices. It, 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 it makes that stuff go away or just subside. So that was really like, that was like a job that I really enjoyed because you know you can really engage people get a part be a part of their life and help them to really reintegrate in society so getting entitlements getting clothes getting an apartment um it, that was it was a great feeling um so mental illness is just like asthma or arthritis right you have the symptoms you take medication to get what you need okay uh, society still believes that a person who is mentally ill still needs to show more willpower to be able to pull themselves together. So having some unrealistic expectations on them say, man, you need to snap out of it. Like, why are you acting crazy? Why don't you act like, normal? Or something. Right. Like, Come on, damn. Yeah. Right. Especially with depression. I think yeah. that's a really hard one because we all feel mm-hmm. depression, but it's pretty much short term with us. I mean, once it, it, it lasts longer than a week, then that's when it's a huge problem. Yeah. Um, um, but, you know, those expectations that we put on folks with mental illnesses are really unrealistic. That would be like if it was me and, and Miss Linda standing here by this chair and I have one leg and you said, well, you guys have a race to this to the front door out here. And the expectation would be for me to possibly beat Miss Linda running there. She's going to beat me all the time because she got two legs. I only got one. I don't know about that. Right. <laughs> I, only got, I only got one. So, you know, folks with a mental illness, they have a broken brain. Right. So they have some, um, you know, they have some needs that that they need to meet to, to make sure that their brains are balanced so that they can function in a way that is uh, most appropriate. So uh, people that are depressed and some that can come up out of it, is it the will for them to come up, up out of it or is it their brain is probably just stronger or whatever and they can just overcome it? Well, I think it's a lot of uh, variables, but I mean, it's all about like what got them into depression, because right now we may not be none of us in this room may be diagnosed with depression. But God forbid, you know, one of our family members dies like tragically. Right. Someone dies tragically and that, that we really had a close relationship with something like that could throw us into depression. And, you know, it's all about the treatment. Like, how can we get out of it? You know, how can we, um, you know, are we going to take medication? You know, do we have a, a support system, someone to talk to, um, to, to get out of it? I know that um, I had a uh, aunt who was murdered. Um, I don't know if I shared this with you guys, but it was on the cover of the um, Daily News in, in New York. I mean, she was 77 years old and she was murdered. She was stabbed multiple times. Mm-hmm. And um, set a fire, set a blaze. Yeah. So, you know, so my sister, who was really had a close relationship with her, she was um, went to identify the body. And, um, you know, and also she went to the house because um, my aunt bequeathed some of the things to her. So she went to go get some of the things Said, hey, Mike, you want to come with me? I said, no, I'm not going over there. I don't want to see this stuff. Right. But my sister went and she saw um, those things and uh, she saw the essentially the crime scene oh, so she saw the blood oh, and man. she saw the, uh, the smoke the charred smoke mm-hmm. so it affected her 
mentally, yeah. right? Now she's still able to go to work and she's still able to have a relationship, but she can't drive in the night because when she's driving her car, she has these images of blood mm -hmm. and arms and limbs Ooh. coming at her. And I'm trying to tell her that, you know, you need to go and get some mental health counseling on this. You need to process this. But she's looking at it like something is wrong, right? She's looking at it like um, if I go and get counseling, it's looking like I'm crazy, yeah. but I'm like, well, you know, you have grandchildren now mm -hmm. and you also have, um, you know, she has a son, 25 living with her and another son who's 14 years old. And I'm and like, well, God forbid it. if something happens to them yeah. okay. in the middle of the night and you need to take them to the hospital, mm -hmm. how are you going to do it? Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm trying to make it seem practical for her. But those stereotypes, it's like we definitely got to get away from those stereotypes and look at it as like a health issue. It's just a mental health issue um particularly in the african-american community right say, you no, know we we don't like look either. at that as something that is um you know as as a problem we look at it like you sh you should be strong enough to endure whatever it is mm -hmm. you know i think it's our history that well, is that, that, that in mm -hmm. place yeah mm -hmm. Right. It, it is our history in, in place. But then on, on the flip side, now, if, if Aunt Mabel comes in a dream, comes and talks to you in a dream and says, hey, Linda, I got these lottery numbers for you. You know, <laughs> you, you got, you, you're going to say, oh, my God, thank you. Right. Mm -hmm. But but no one's going to look at you like you're mentally ill. Right, so that's right, another flip exactly. side of exactly. the culture mm -hmm. there as well. So all of these things. So some things are realistic and some things are not realistic. Mm -hmm. So really just deciphering what is and what's not. So some myths um, associated with mental illness. Mental illness is caused by bad parenting. The fact is most diagnosed individuals come from supportive homes. It could be two family homes. It's just somebody having a you know, mental illness breakdown. You know, the onset is normally, like I said, normally the late teens, early 20s. Uh, when I first moved here from New York, I worked with this guy. He was an incredible artist. Uh, we worked at a level five school together. We used to take the bus together, take the, take it home, and um, you know I talked to him. He was originally from New York as well, so we instantly became fast friends. A um, couple years after I left that job, I see this guy walking in the street. He was totally disheveled, and I'm trying to talk to him, and he was just totally I not think engaged. My is some I really think he needs some psychological help. Well, well, it's I genetic do. as well. Is someone yeah, in the family? I think on his dad's side, you know, it was um, they had a lot of. I say crazy people. I mean, really, you know, and I'm people with mental honest. illnesses. But. Yeah, and I and you know, I'm really thinking about that. And I told him, I said, really, I think you need to get some help. Mm -hmm. You know, and he said, I'm tired. You calling me crazy, you know, whatever. So it's like at this point, all I can do is pray because I can't make him do it. How old is but he? But I see tw he'll be 22 in December. Mm -hmm. Right. So and I really, this is a child that was quiet. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And now he seems to think he's had this traumatic childhood, and you know. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, what is going, right. where is all this coming from? Sure. You know, and he's always hysterical and it's like he's talking out of his head. Right. Then he'll call me back and he calm. Right. You know, and I'm like, something is not right. And at one time, I'm like, you need to come home because he's been in PA for the last four years. I sure. said, maybe you need to take a break from school, the stress, and come home. Right. Sure. Well, he got like a couple more months and he'll be finished, but God never know when he come home, he came here with me. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping. That he can See, he's just like the other parents right no, there. I'm serious. <laughs> I'm serious. Because I'm the one he's attacked. Right. You know what I'm saying? I'm the one he's attacked. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have to find a part of some form of that, even if I have to pay for it. Sure. Mm -hmm. But at some point, I'm serious, he's going to need some help, and I see it coming. Right. Well, you know, again, you, you're going to see some signs and that sounds like, you know, that it could be schizophrenia. I mean, we're gonna break, we're gonna, I'm going to review the different types of mental illnesses and you can see if some of the symptoms are there. I mean, we definitely want to be cautious in terms mm -hmm. of placing diagnoses. You know, if anything, you definitely want to encourage and support him when you get in like yeah, an evaluation. You know your own child before somebody, especially when you've had Yeah, absolutely. Before that, you know, right. trust and believe something going on up yeah. in Absolutely. And I mean, well, I I mean, a lot of the young folks that you see, uh, maybe in our family or even in the community, I mean, that's why they smoke a lot of marijuana, right? Because that's easy, accessible. I mean, they're self-medicated. And it ain't like, you know, 20 years ago when you could just smoke one little joint. I mean, they smoking a blunt like this long and they doing like six to ten a day, right? And that's a part of that's a part of the um 
that, that's some self-medicating. So having the marijuana, having beer, and constantly being high to the point where you're more high and, and inebriated than being sober, right? Because you're anesthetizing yourself, you're totally numbing yourself to, um, you're numbing those feelings of voices and, and so forth and depression. So um, another myth with it, and we discussed this earlier, we said the mentally ill are violent and dangerous people where the fact is most are victims of violence. So a lot of those folks that are in the streets that are homeless, they are indeed uh, victims of violence because they're so vulnerable. They're right out there in the streets that anybody can take advantage of them, you know, rob them, beat them up, whatever, violate them because they're just there. That's why you see a lot of mental ill people sleeping during the day because they don't want to be awake, I mean, sleeping at night. So they'll sleep in the day so they can w walk around at night because that's when the streets are not populated when people can take advantage of them as well. Um, people with a mental disorder are not smart. That's a myth, okay? Numer 